Happy Independence, Bahamas. Bahamians celebrate 49 years of independence across the archipelago and the United States. Plus, the country's oldest cultural expression is back. Junkanoers are all set to take the street named Bay at midnight. And it's Bahari for us on Independence Day. Happy Independence and welcome to our news weekend edition. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Megan Shepard. Clifford Park came alive last night with the 49th celebration of Bahamian independence. The ecumenical service and cultural experience took place to the enjoyment of countless Bahamians. Berthony McDermott was there and filed this report. It was a display of Bahamian pride. Bahamians flooded Clifford Park on the eve of independence to celebrate the journey to 49 years. Many saw it as a breath of fresh air and another step on the road to normalcy amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Like these residents who said after being under emergency for nearly two years and unable to gather in such a setting, they're ready to celebrate. The night I'm going to skin teeth, skin my head, flip on my feet when that marching band come through. Can't wait. Is that what you're looking forward to the most, the marching band? I'm looking forward for every single thing. Now, I'm looking forward for that drunk canoe on tomorrow night, leading into Monday morning. And so I have to go to work on Tuesday so my ankle could be burst right up. Oh, this is this is indeed a this is indeed a blessing because um, uh, for a long time everybody was locked down. So I think the payment pe people really love it. I love it. My family loves it. So, yeah. The evening started with the ecumenical service. This featured the best in Bahamian gospel, while members of the clergy sent up prayers for the nation. We thank you that we're going to be covered all the way to the end of November from this hurricane season. We thank you that we're going to be preserved, Father God, from floods and tropical storms that bring destruction and disaster. In his sermon Saturday night, Christian Council President Bishop Delton Fernando reflected on where we came from as a nation and where we are going. He talked about us being able, first of all, to abound in hope. To have a hope in Jesus Christ that he who brought us safe this far and allows tourism to rebound will continue to take us forward. And then we must be unbound, that we've been bound up so long that we must loose ourselves and celebrate as the proud people we are. And then we must hold on to God's hand. And in the midst of our transition, that we don't lose our faith in God. I believe we are a blessed country and it's a time to celebrate. Now following the ecumenical service came a cultural extravaganza that rocked Clifford Park, featuring some of the top names in Bahamian entertainment. Attendees heard melodious voices like Sweet Emily and Colin McDonald. The night wrapped up with the traditional inspection of the guard and the raising of the flag. Reporting for our news, I'm Berthony McDermott. Definitely an amazing show to witness. Thanks, Berthony. Well, the nation's second city also holding its own independence celebrations last night. The Independence Cultural Show and Extravaganza featuring the best of the best of Grand Bahamas musical, musical artists and performers. Like the Capitol's celebrations, the extravaganza went from gospel performances to theater performances to a flag raising ceremony and a fireworks show. Grand Bahamians and even visitors showed up for a first hand look at the island's first independence event since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. And they were not disappointed. There was also a message from the Grand Bahama Christian Council. Grand Bahama Christian Council President Reverend Kenneth Lewis was one of the night's only featured speakers. As the Bahamas always do, 
what is in the best interest of the Bahamas. The question for us gathered here this evening is, despite our challenges, despite our set, setbacks, and all that could erode our confidence, why are we proud of being a Bahamian? It is a question all of us must ask ourselves and answer. Meantime, Transport Minister Joe Beth Colby Davis providing an update on charges that are expected to be levied against Carnival Cruise Lines. Back in 2017, Carnival Cruise Lines dumped sewage, food and waste in Bahamian waters. Colby Davis says that, that situation is being managed. The Port Department does their review and assessment and then they provide information to the DEPP. The DEPP has to work along with the Attorney General's office to actually come together on a form of penalty that's legal and acceptable. And so the DEPP would have actually have to provide when it comes to the penalties, what's the next step. Four students, two from high school and two from a tertiary institution, will have an opportunity to win an all-expense-paid trip to attend COP27 in Egypt this November. Entrants will be required to submit an essay and video on an assigned topic. Retired Justice Ruby Nottage serves as the chairman of the selection committee. COP27 is at Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt, um, but obviously they will probably visit Cairo, I mean, you can imagine visiting maybe even the pyramids. This is a fantastic opportunity for any group of young people. And so I, I hope that they come out and uh, submit. And um, we're getting some good uh, applications. Quality is high. Our Bahamians are brilliant, you know. When they put their mind to it, they can do anything. The deadline for entries is July 14th. A short list will be selected from the initial applicants. These are the four people who are going to represent the Bahamas. And we want to be sure that they're comfortable with themselves, with the topic of climate change. They're going to be going into an international arena where they won't have me next to them. And others are going to be asking, you know, are you from the Bahamas? Uh, well, what's the problem there? And they've got to be able to verbalize that. Still to come on our news, tie a yellow ribbon around the silk cotton tree. Preservation or destruction? We have the details coming up. And in our world headline segment, the longest serving Japanese premier is gunned down at the age of 67. Those details when our news returns. Welcome back to our news weekend edition. Since 2000, the John Canoe Development Association's focus has been the advancement of John Canoe. Today, they continue to manage the Independence John Canoe Parade, the People's Love and Unity Rush, which is now the third largest John Canoe Parade next to Boxing Day and New Year's Day. After a brief break because of COVID-19, John Canoes are back on bay to celebrate independence in love and unity. JDA Secretary says this year's event will pay tribute to those no longer with us. The events in Rosson Square will begin at 12.01 on Monday morning, July the 11th. We will begin with a brief in-memoriam tribute to those fallen junk news who have passed on from the time of the last parade on Bay Street, January 2020, until now. While fans have been looking forward to the return of the Independence Parade, so have the groups. Yet, despite the competitive nature of John Canoe, Nash Ferguson says everyone is free to join in the parade with their favorite group. The whole island, the whole country is invited. Let's get in the street and let us celebrate our independence in our unique way. All we ask is that you wear your fly colors, you bring your best behavior, and we ask the Junkanoo groups to please allow the public to jump in either at the front or at the back. We won't disturb your music. This summer, roadworks and tree removals have many asking how protected our protected trees. And what was the process like to remove the latest silk cotton tree on Village Road? Marlena Leonard got an exclusive with the Village Road Improvement Project as well as the forestry unit to find out more. 
Once upon a time, New Providence was a place known for its silk cotton trees, with the great silk cotton tree on Blue Hill Road becoming one of the most globally recognizable of the 19th century. This historical legacy may be part of the reason some were outraged by the sight of the start of the removal of what's said to be a potentially hundreds-year-old silk cotton tree on the corner of Village Road. The reason for the removal? The Village Road Improvement Project. But it should be noted that the plans for the tree's removal have not been kept under wraps. The resident engineer for the project, Albion Simonet Jr., tells our news as part of the process of getting permission to remove the tree, details of the Village Road Improvement Project, including the tree's fate, were discussed in public forums. We had a public consultation. Uh, we've had some town hall meetings for the project. We've had stakeholder engagements with the BNTs and the other entities and the like. Uh, so uh, considering all that uh, and then making the application finally, uh, and then a lot of phone calls, a lot of following up, um, you know, a professional environmental manager is on the project with Nodes Construction, who is the contractor. And so in doing all of that, we were able to secure uh, approval to remove the tree. Simonet also says the discussion to remove the tree was not haphazardly made. He goes out of his way to show our news the paper trail of permissions and plans, sharing that earlier plans had hoped for the tree to be able to stay where it was. We really didn't want to touch it. We ran through a lot of different designs and iterations. And in the final analysis, we even considered potentially putting a roundabout around the tree. But between land limitations and the fact that the forestry unit is citing evidence that the tree may be rotting from the inside, they went forward with a plan for removal. Simonet stresses, aside from the approval fee from the forestry unit, they also had to meet a three to one mitigation requirement, meaning for the removal of this tree, they would have to plant three more to replace it. The permissions process is rather simple and the same for private citizens, large developers and the government alike. So what's the cost of the permit to remove a protected, potentially hundreds year old tree? $15. Just $5 for the application and an additional $10 if your application is approved. Acting Director of the Forestry Unit, Danielle Hannock, says this is due to decades old legislation and hopes the outdated laws can be improved soon. We're looking to work with stakeholders to modify this because even other developments, let's say you have a subdivision and you have an area that's 50 acres and they're going to harvest or clear cut, let's say 30 of those. So even though they have green spaces incorporated, there's still a significant tree loss. And so they would still pay the minimal fee, which is not reflective of what's happening to the environment. So we understand this flaw and we're working with stakeholders to modify that. And most of the developers that we've been speaking with understand this concept because it's, it's like that in other jurisdictions. For now, focus remains on the next generation of silk cotton trees under the watchful eye of Leishas Halder, a plant specialist subcontracted by Knowles Construction. And as for the Village Road tree, the VRIP has made plans with Antiques, Monuments and Museums Corporation to work with local artisans to make sure the wood doesn't go to waste. Reporting for our news, I'm Marlena Leonard. Shinzo Abe, former Japanese Prime Minister, was assassinated on Friday past, shocking a nation where gun violence and political attacks are almost unheard of. Abe, Japan's most influential and longest serving Prime Minister, worked to rejuvenate that nation's economy with his namesake Abenomics policy. He also strived to rebuild Japan's role on the global stage. At the time of his assassination, the former prime minister was giving a speech for a candidate in Nara, a city in western Japan, just ahead of today's parliamentary elections. A man fatally shot him from behind with a handmade firearm. Police arrested the suspect identified as Tetsuya Yamagami, a 41-year-old unemployed former member of Japan's Maritime Defense Force. Police say he confessed to the crime, but his motive remains unclear. Abe was 67. Seven. When our news comes back from the break, Sandsbury continues to bounce back after Hurricane Dorian's devastation and Bahari for independence, a must for our news. We have the details right here in the Weekend Edition. The production line still on the move at the Bahamas Brewery and Beverage Factory in Freeport. The facility was damaged by Hurricane Dorian in 2019, which resulted in its closing until October of last year. The company saying that in addition to operations resuming in full, tours of the facility have also resumed. As you know, the brewery was damaged and we were down and as well as because of that, Sands and all of our other bread brands um, more or less had to be removed from the market. But the brewery has, since then, it's been rebuilt, it's operational, the line is 
moving and we do hope that eventually we can get you down there for a tour of the brewery. The move to keep the factory in Freeport, despite the many setbacks, is a commitment to supporting the Freeport economy. And what's great is that every time Mr. Sands keeps getting these knockdowns, it's amazing. He builds it back up and makes it even better. And it's been phenomenal for people in Grand Bahama because, of course, he kept everybody employed. And he still has to this date, which is great. So I think that's why um, many Grand Bahamians are very proud of the beer. And I think what's lovely is that it's just as popular here and in the rest of the islands. It's truly Bahamian. It's brewed by Bahamians. It's bottled by Bahamians. And it's sold by Bahamians. And if you're interested, the brewery is welcoming residents to tour the facilities in Freeport. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. The Bahamas Brewery and Beverage Company once again rolling out its bottle return initiative. The company is looking to collect 5,000 cases each month with the goal of reusing the bottles on their production line. We collect all Sans bottles from all of our brands, not Sans, Sans Light, to Six Steps, our Rattlers, Pink, Passion. We have our High Rock as well as our strong back all of our bottles return and all empty cases right now you receive two dollars for every empty case that you return looking to take advantage of this project and to make a little extra cash here's how you can get involved bottles can be returned either here at our Nassau Street location at our Jimmy Wines and Spurs location on East Bay and our Jimmy Wines and Spurs location at the Airport Industrial Park now anyone who has the bottles to so please bring your bottles in like I say you have empty bottles we will give you cash for the bottles and there will be, as we relaunch, there's also a price increase on the amount of money that we'll be giving out per bottles because we're very serious from the top. Um, our CEO, we're very serious about getting these bottles back in and doing our part to keep the island clean. You can visit or call any of the Jimmy's Wines and Spirits locations for more information. And still to come after the break, your Independence Holiday Weekend weather forecast. Plus, Bahamians in Atlanta celebrate independence. And it's Bahari for Independence Day. That's coming up when our news weekend edition returns. Welcome back to our news weekend edition. A Miss Bahamas contestant is opening up about how the loss of a loved one prepared for the national pageant stage. Jared Higgs has more details in this report. Miss Bahamas Universe contestant, 22-year-old J.L. Peters' life changed back on September 27, 2015. Waking up on a Sunday morning to wash clothes, the then 15-year-old found her 37-year-old mother, Marsha Peters, dead from a heart attack. Went from just thinking about what I could eat at lunch the next day to having to figure out, okay, got to help with the sisters, help with my brother. We got homework, then this BGCSE is coming up and just trying to make my mother proud. Peters had to grow up quickly and nearly seven years on, she's a Miss Bahamas Universe contestant, competing as Miss New Providence. Peters isn't just inspired by her late mother, but also by her father, RBPF Press Liaison Officer, Superintendent Audley Peters. His nickname for her is Magic. Raising four kids by himself after the passing of my mom, I just, I just inspired him because plenty of people are always ask me, who are you staying with? Who else would I stay with? I'm staying with my father. Peters and her fellow pageant sisters are hard at work preparing for the pageant's grand finale set for July 31st at the Atlanta showroom. And while she was heartbroken by her mother's untimely death, she says the experience molded her into the woman she is today. I have really grown and really matured and I'm... There's nothing else I can tell you about it, but yeah. Reporting for our news, I'm Jared Higgs. All the best to you. Independence season is a time for showing Bahamian pride, and many take it very seriously, proudly wearing the aquamarine, black and gold, wherever and however they can. Our Jean Joseph looks at a Bahamian brand that has taken independence fashion to new levels. Independence is here again, and many people are looking for that perfect graphic tee, flag-inspired attire, or accessory to ensure their Bahamian pride shines brightly over the long weekend. And while there are options around town, many people find themselves drawn to certain brands like Bahari, which has been providing style options since 2014. Rache Borden explains her love for the brand. I chose Bahari over their designs, the quality of the shirts, and I love the way that the shirt fits me. 
Like it was just made for me. Barton says the quality is worth every penny. You pay for good quality, so their prices are fairly good to me. I'm still rocking my anything from like, from 2019, I believe. That's what I'm sure from that, so. As Bahari offers their ninth line of independence-inspired clothing, Bahari brand liaison Dai San says the company strives to remain the best option. Whatever your needs are, Bahari is certainly the brand for you. We've worked very hard to deliver excellent designs at excellent price points at the best quality for our customers. Another longtime Bahari customer, Lawrence L.H. Harrison, says the Bahari quality is what keeps him coming back. I wear a lot of their shirts and all is quality, quality. I'm on real quality shirts. So as you can see, these shirts here, these are some of the best shirts they offer right now for independence, men, women, and children. And you get a good deal on it. You know, you go out of prices, 50, 60, 70, on barriers like 35, 40. Reasonable prices for good quality shirts to wear on this special day, Independence. Bahari is available at their two locations, downtown or in the Meldon Mall, or you can order online. Whatever brand you choose, remember that it's all about looking good while celebrating our independence. I am Gene Joseph, reporting for Our News. Thanks, Jean. The weather is holding up just right over this holiday weekend. Let's see what's in store for us next week. Well, the Bahamas totally changed on July 10th, 1973, when the Union Jack was lowered and our Bahamian flag of black, aquamarine and gold was hoisted on the flagpole. Bahamians around the world are celebrating our country's 49th birthday. The Bahamian consulate located in Atlanta, Georgia, held its independence celebrations yesterday in downtown Atlanta in Piedmont Park. Donna Smith Morgan captured these videos of Bahamians enjoying the fun. Oh yeah! Woo! Oh Lord, address, address! Definitely looks fun. Thank you once again, Donner, for that video. And once again, happy Independence Day, all Bahamians across the globe, and a special thanks to Bahari for outfitting our entire news team in Independence Gear. Thank you at home for joining us for our news weekend edition. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Megan Shepard. Continue to enjoy your holiday weekend.